Hello, everyone. We're going to give people a couple minutes to uh, join us here. Uh, feel free to pop into the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. We'd love to see you. Hello, Iowa. I'm in Florida and Ron is in New York. Houston, Texas, Tampa, Florida. I know Brian Gelb. How are you doing, Brian? All right, I see people are still joining us. Take a moment if you would like and pop into the chat. Let us know where you're coming from today. We're going to get started in just a minute. Arizona, California, all over the country. This is great to see. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Chicago, Detroit, Vancouver, Washington. I'm just wondering, Jay, if there's anyone that's outside the United States. That'd also be a, a fun fact if uh, someone wants to identify themselves as such. Vancouver nearly caught me, but then it's Washington. Almost, almost, that's right. Almost, so close. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Jay Wilson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategic Communications here at BWF. I'm accredited in public relations and a certified public relations counselor. With more than 25 years of experience in the communications and marketing field, working with a variety of nonprofit organizations and fundraising campaigns, large and small. With me today is Rod Grabowski, the Vice President for Advancement at the University of Buffalo. Rod, you want to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Oh, it's my pleasure, Jay. Thank you for this opportunity. And that, uh, Jay, uh, I was actually counting recently, and I've been in the advancement profession now for going on 30 years or 30 plus years. I've uh, been at uh, six different universities, and now I think I have counted eight comprehensive campaigns that I've been a part of. So I have worked at uh, smaller uh, liberal arts uh uh, types of uh, private universities earlier in my career, and then I made the jump to public uh, higher education in 2002 and have not looked back. It's been a great ride, and I really love everything that uh, I'm doing in this uh, profession. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. Well, I'm just delighted that you're able to join us today, Rod. And uh, you and I, when we were talking about this, we said this will be uh, the continuation of a 14-year-long conversation you and I have been having. It's hard to believe, but you know, I just got out of college, so I can't believe it's been 14 years. We must well, you know, we, we started it in kindergarten, right? <laughs> so, right, we started having this conversation uh, 14 years ago uh, with, at the University of South Florida Foundation, and we were getting ready to embark on a $1 billion campaign at the USF, and our very first conversation was essentially, why do we do campaigns? And uh, this, you showed me a chart similar to this one when we had that conversation. That's right, Jay. And this chart is something that I have done now since I uh, uh, first was exposed to this uh, concept of visual display about your fundraising history. And I've done a chart like this for the University of South Florida, also the University of Cincinnati, where uh, when I was there and served as the president of the foundation, and now here at the University at Buffalo. And I will tell you for all three of those universities, this chart basically tells the same story, is that the orange bars that you see, the campaign average, campaign median, uh, generally those are become the new floors. After a campaign, uh, those become the new floors of your fundraising performance. In particular, the campaign median becomes the new floor. You generally never look back and go, go lower than that. So it really emphasizes the fact that the growth that happens of your fundraising um, during a campaign period, it's going to be transformational for your university or your organization for 
forever. And uh, this, uh, this chart shows us back to 1984, and it shows the different campaigns that we at the University of Buffalo have been a part of. And I'm just so pleased to say that uh, our, uh, the growth that we have seen, we live up to this chart. Once again, we've never fallen below the campaign median after the campaign is concluded. And we're in a boldly Buffalo campaign right now that started in uh, July 1 of 2013 to, and that uh, we anticipate closing it within the next year. Uh, and we've seen some explosive growth in our fundraising in the past uh, three to four years. Uh, we anticipate hitting, uh, once again, a record fundraising uh, this, this year, ending June 30. And uh, uh, we're living up to what this chart has always told us in the past, is that campaigns have a lasting effect. Well, and, and you know, the focus of this conversation and, and our first conversation, we started with this. And this really does explain why we do campaigns. But the focus was on the communications and marketing piece of the campaign and how campaigns, even though they're amazing fundraising tools, they're really tremendous communications and marketing tools as well. Yeah, and if I could just jump off on that for a moment, Jay, I mean, that really is uh, the main story here is because I know at Buffalo with our Boldly Buffalo campaign, and we saw it at the University of South Florida and we saw it at Cincinnati. It, you know, campaign changes the narrative about how you talk about yourself forever. And, but it also sets um, new expectations with your donors and, and a deeper connection to, and a commitment to philanthropy. Well, you know, I firmly believe that campaigns are the best communications and marketing tools uh, any organization can have. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're in agreement. And, and I think, you know, when we start talking about what should we call our, our webinar today, we said it's the power of perception because we're, we're talking about how campaigns directly impact organizational perception in countless ways. We're going to quite ambitiously, I think, try to just go through four of those ways today. But we're going to look at how uh, audiences perceive your organization before and after a campaign and audiences can be donors prospects, alumni, volunteers, government officials, community partners, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, we're going to talk about how campaigns change the way philanthropists and donors view themselves as being part of the campaign. You know, we always think of our donors as heroes, but the right kind of storytelling will help them see themselves that way as well. Uh, the culture of philanthropy is something that I think you and every other vice president of advancement on the planet is trying to imbue in their organization. Campaigns give you the opportunity to do that in a way that few other uh, programs really do. Uh, it's almost, uh, it's been a buzzword for so long, it's almost a cliche, but we really can build a culture of philanthropy through your campaign communications internally. And we'll talk about that too. And finally, uh, the impact of campaigns can stretch far beyond the four corners of your organization. And we have an example here that I know that Rod is justifiably proud of. So we'll talk about how campaigns can change how your community and your community partners uh, see themselves. So with that, let's start with how campaigns provide you a second chance to make a first impression. And Rod, I go back to my own background here, we're working at the Florida right. Institute of Technology. Uh, we were working on our 50th anniversary and we decided to do some research. We did a lot of, we did a telephone research, we did focus groups, we did all kinds of real research work in the communities we served, to trying to understand how people perceived us. Um, and what we learned was that there wasn't a great understanding of the institution's history or its role in the space program or even in the community itself. So the goal anniversary campaign, which I'll be the first to admit is not the most inspiring name, did, gave a, did give us an inspiring opportunity, which was to retell the history of the organization to a lot of our community partners for the very first time. Um, so we talked about how Florida Tech was founded by a guy named Jerome Cooper, who was a scientist at the Cape working on the race for space. Sputnik had just orbited the Earth, and, and Jerome was fired up about it one night in a bar in 
New Galley, Florida, uh, o, o Galley, Florida. And someone said, well, if you're so fired up about it, Jerry, here's, here's your first donation. Go start a university and, and, and bring us more scientists to the Cape. And the guy threw down 37 cents on the bar top and Jerry pocketed it and said, by golly, I'm going to do it. And that was the beginning of the Florida Institute of Technology, which is still a vibrant university on Florida's space coast today. And we were able to take that story, that foundational story, and make it the heart of that campaign. Uh, we used advertising, we used marketing, we did a campaign video, campaign website, did all kinds of, you know, early on social media back then. Uh, Facebook was just coming about. And so there were, there were ways for us to tell the story in new ways even then. I even wrote a coffee table book. I think, I think you know this. I wrote a coffee table yeah. book based on that gift and, and the history of Florida Tech. And all of it was tied in to the message about Florida Tech and its entrepreneurial roots and its roots in the space program and what a difference it made. Uh, and frankly, in the U.S.'s uh, race to space. What so, a great story. It's, it was a tremendous opportunity to reframe what the institution was and what it had really meant to the community it served. Have you come across a way to, with campaigns can allow you to do that as well? You know, I think that uh, it is pivotal now for me. That's, it's, it's almost my litmus test, if you will, of whether or not a campaign is successful in its branding and marketing is if it does exactly what you just did at Florida Tech. Um, I know arriving here, and I'll, I'll, you know, later in the slide deck, we'll talk about it, but here at Buffalo, uh, when I started just about five years ago, um, you know, I was, I was being told, well, we don't like to talk about what we're doing. And I said, well, because we're, we're very humble and that's the, the kind of the Buffalo way. And, uh, you know, my response to that was, we need to talk about what we're good at and what we're proud of because no one knows but can we at least, and, and I'm re being respectful of the, uh, the, the nature of Buffalonians being uh, humble and uh, a bit more reserved in regards to that. But I said, can we at least be humbly proud to the point that we're talking about it, but we're not being cocky or arrogant. And that really has kind of defined how we have approached all of our communications and marketing for the university and for the campaign over the past five years. And there's so much more that we're talking about, but we're not doing it in a boastful way. We're doing it just to make sure people are aware of the great things that are happening. One thing I didn't mention, Rod, and I'll mention it now, there is a Q&A function here. And as people have questions, please feel free to uh, put your questions into the Q&A. Rod and I are monitoring that. And we'll be sure to see it. You know, what, what really made it work for us at Florida Tech is that we took the time to do the research in the beginning to really measure attitudes both inside and outside of the institution. Uh, we did uh, telephone polling, we did focus groups, we did online surveys. So we really had a good understanding of, of where we stood with our publics and our audiences. And we were able to uh, develop a campaign, plan a campaign that addressed the issues that we found. Um, I, I think, all too often, there's, there's some planning, there's a lot of implementing, but there's not a lot of research in the beginning of a campaign to really understand kind of the baseline of, of how you're thought of and how you're understood. Jay, I can't agree more. I mean, you know my feelings in regards to this. Uh, uh, as we've talked in our, our work uh, with the University of South Florida when we established the USF Unstoppable campaign, that whole branding and marketing was uh, that we built was all based upon that research that you talk about. And it was imperative to make it, it made it, give it, it gave it depth, it gave it meaning, it gave it value. So, uh, and, and it was uh, tremendously powerful. Absolutely. And, and <clears throat> campaign communications really work uh, from 30,000 feet up, uh, but they also can really impact people at a very personal level. Um, and I know that you've worked with many donors over the years who uh, come to see themselves as an integral part of any campaign that, you're, that they're a part of. And they really view the campaign as a way to kind of enhance their own personal story. And, 
this is not uh, this is not a coincidence. I think uh, placing philanthropists at the heart of your story, of your campaign story, is really important today. Um, I've got some I've got some numbers here, Rod. I know you might be able to expand on these, but you know, Case is telling us that top one percent of campaign donors provide more than eighty percent of funding, and Giving USA is saying that individuals are providing more than 80% of all charitable giving as recently as two years ago. And that number is expected to be up higher when right. we look at the numbers again. So individuals and, uh, and their instruments are critically important to successful campaigns. They really are. And that uh, uh, really getting at the heart of what drives a donor, uh, it is uh, oftentimes a journey and it, it takes uh, much time to develop that relationship and really understand it as potential individual philanthropists really figure out what's important to them. It's a little bit easier with corporations and foundations. They're a little bit more prescribed in regards to what they want to give to and why, but an individual doesn't spend nearly as much time um, with their first gifts and really understanding what's their motivation and drive. So uh, um, you're right, though, uh, you know, what you uh, identify here is that placing the donor at the heart of your institution's story really helps others also determine what their uh, passion is and how they can contribute. We have our first question, and, and it's probably a good one to, before we, we transition. Uh, when you have two or three different audiences, do you recommend showing the same to each or different to each especially when they speak different languages and are in different parts of the USA. I, that's a great question and, and you, you really have to be targeted. Uh, if you have different audiences, you may have different messages to reach those audiences and you may need to use different platforms, which we'll talk a little bit towards the end uh, to distribute those messages. So uh, the, the old days of the, the shotgun approach and everybody gets the same message are really gone. I think everything is much more targeted. We have uh, another question here. Uh, how do you fundraise ethically, avoid catering to a few wealthy donors when 1% of the campaign donors provide 80% of the funding? You know, and if I could answer that uh, is that, you know, we at, here at the University of Buffalo, uh, since this is a comprehensive $1 billion plus campaign, uh, we really are uh, talking to donors at all levels of giving. It could be, you know, they only give a dollar or $10 through our uh, day of giving campaign, or we do individual one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with those that we think have greater capacity. But we, we work to, once again, find what's important to each donor at each level and, um, and find ways to, for people to give that is meaningful to them. So I don't, view it as that we're being exclusionary. Uh, we're just trying to find the right entry points for people uh, based upon where they feel comfortable entering. Understood. And, I, and that also ties quite nicely to the first question, which is there are different messages for different audiences and different ways to distribute those messages. So uh, you have to meet people where they live. So I, I this only brings us to uh, Russell James, who is um, flat, uh, a faculty member at Texas Tech, and he's done a lot of research on philanthropy and what, uh, what motivates people to give. I think it, it, research is fascinating, and he caught my attention because I like Star Wars. I know <laughs> that surprises you, Rod, after all these years, but I, really, me at all. <laughs> I love me some Star Wars, and Star Wars is based on Joseph Campbell. Uh, the hero's journey. And uh, the donor has a giving journey similar to Luke Skywalker's journey in Star Wars. Uh, has an original identity. In Luke's case, he was a farm boy and living in desert planet. Then he has a challenge to join Obi-Wan Kenobi on a, on a crusade, uh, a mission to help a princess. Uh, he has a victory blows up the Death Star, and he has an enhanced identity. He's now a hero of the rebellion against the Empire. So that's the hero's journey in a nutshell. 
<laughs> and we take uh, our donors on a similar hero's journey. Every time we write a case statement, every time we uh, create a video, every time we do something on social media that targets a specific donor or a specific group of donors, and certainly every time we write a proposal, uh, we're taking them on the hero's journey. Um, so I think uh, the, the slide here kind of talks about where how the donor kind of lines up in Luke Skywalker's own journey here. But really and truly, the, the, the victory here is making the gift and going from thinking of yourself in a certain way as a donor and having other people think of you in a certain way, going through the process, being guided by the fundraising officer. And, and you'll like the fact that Russell thinks that the fundraising officers are all either Gandalf the Greys or Obi-Wan Kenobi's, depending upon your favorite science fiction or fantasy story. Um, and the enhanced identity is ultimately what the fundraiser is selling. Uh, James calls it the fundamental value provided to donors, the warm glow they receive from making a gift. And externally, this is delivering an enhanced public reputation. And internally, this is delivering stronger personal identity and self-worth. You must have seen this over the years in the donors you've worked with. Oh, Jay, uh, you know, the one story that comes to my mind, and it, uh, not every gift is million, $10 million that are this impactful. I, I remember when I was at the University of North Florida, uh, it was about uh, two weeks after uh, an incident that happened where a mom came into my office and her son was a uh, student at the university. He then uh, served in the Iraq war and was killed over there. So two weeks after um, his death, you know, she comes in wearing his purple heart and mm. wanted to do something to really uh, memorialize him and all that he stood for, established a, a scholarship. And next thing you know, the story got out in the community and we had community individuals stepping up. And so that initial donation, um, it was, I think, 20 fold uh over wow. by community donations and it just was that heartwarming story so you talk about that original identity the challenge the victory then the enhanced identity it, it really lives full circle for me with that whole experience that um uh you know i got to witness as uh, she went through this well you know what's amazing is it, we know this storytelling we in the past we would we would do kind of a, B kind of focus groups and what story kind of grabs you. And all this now can be done much more scientifically. I, I'm amazed that we can now say with certainty, it's not supposition, that there's a functional change in the brain when you tell these kinds of stories to prospects and potential donors. Um, we know this because they actually now use functional MRI machines. <laughs> And they monitor what parts of the brain light up when you are taking them through this journey, through a proposal, through a case statement, watching a video, they put themselves in that position. And when you do it the right way, the parts of the brain that light up are the parts that either lead to making a gift or volunteering. And I would try to pronounce those parts of the brain, but I'm not going to embarrass myself in a live <laughs> webinar, but the research is out there. It's really some really amazing peer reviewed work and it's all come around in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so there's really now powerful scientific evidence of the efficacy of storytelling. Well, you know how I feel about that, Jay. Storytelling is really what helps make a campaign come to life. And, and it gives it a, a personal touch. It gives it meaning. It gives it that depth that people are looking for when they're looking to make a, a, a philanthropic investment. So uh, that, you know, oftentimes they then see themselves in that same scenario, what's important to them after they've experienced um, an effective uh, story that has been told. Right, right. And while you're seg uh, segueing to the next slide, Jay, I know another question came in, what percentage of campaign contributions are now coming from planned and estate giving? 
Uh, it really depends on the size of your organization and what type of campaign you're in. But for me, uh, I tend to do work at universities that are always doing comprehensive campaigns. So it's all in, it's not just a facility campaign. And I try to uh, have a window of 30 to 40% of uh, uh, campaign contributions being estate or planned gifts. Uh, right. Obviously, if you're just in a building campaign, you can't build a building with an estate gift right away. So it, it really depends upon the character of your campaign and how that uh, uh, percentage should be allocated. You know, what you're trying to accomplish. That's right. At the end, right. And I, and I think uh, uh, BWF has, has answered the question privately as well. So hopefully that- I, I bet you BWF's answer is uh, very similar to mine. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm confident of that, yes. That's right. So, uh, but, please, but do keep the questions coming. We're happy to answer them as we go. So this one, uh, I, I, I love this topic because you and I worked together so closely here. Um, the USF Unstoppable campaign, you know, it's the campaign where we met. It's the campaign that was in this early stages when we had our very first conversation 14 years ago. And, and, and what we didn't realize, I don't know if I realized, you might have realized, I didn't realize what it would do to the internal culture of the university over time. And well, I think that's, that's, the, that's the remarkable thing about the Unstoppable campaign. And frankly, it's lasting legacy. I can honestly say that it is what I had hoped for. And at the time we were working with a, a council, um, you were a staff member and so was I at the University of South Florida. So we had a, a firm that we were working with, a communications firm to really do, I think we did about 50 to 60 interviews of individuals about what was so special to the university? How did they feel about it? And a lot of those probing questions and that's where you know, we got that feedback that people were just so proud and that they felt the university was on this upward trajectory that was unstoppable. And we really needed to focus on that for the future. And, and that's how this all came about. But I don't think we really understood how it was going to change the overall perception of the university for so much uh, more into the future than, uh, than just the campaign. And that was uh, an incredible learning experience for me that now that is what I seek in every single campaign and in the branding and marketing that I have worked on ever since because uh, it evokes an emotion when people talk about it. And that's what you want to have happen with your campaign is you want people to feel something. The emotional so resonance there was really, really important to, for, to, to the campus, to the people that work there. I mean, Yes. We, we knew we had an amazing opportunity to change how everyone inside the university talked about the university and talked about philanthropy. Um, but when you have people on the outside, Jay, that are actually repeating it back to you, you right. know you hit a win. Yes, and, and we did. And that, that was what was happening in, the, in Tampa Bay, in the whole Tampa Bay region. That's right. That's right. Um, and Telling the story meant telling the ways the university had overcome adversity and showcased resilience and proved itself to be unstoppable, starting with the founding of the institution itself. I mean, that was where that story started, similar to Florida Tech, starting with 37 cents and a dream. Right. You now, USF started with a, why would you ever put a university south of Gainesville? Right. Right. You know, those right. kinds of questions. Uh, that's why it's called the University of South Florida, even though, uh, as all Floridians know, we're not really in South Florida in Tampa. So it's just south of Gainesville, south of the University of South of Gainesville, Florida. and they named it South Florida. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that was when air conditioning was coming about. Um, you know, and I think that what was also great about this campaign as well is that it related also to the student in that. Uh, students believing in themselves and believing in a direction and getting donors to invest in students. So we were able to use this in so many ways to tell that story, that impact, and to give students that brighter future. Right, absolutely. And the, and I think, you know, the elevator speech as a concept is still important. Uh, builds an esprit de corps, have a common language at your institution. Also, though, it creates peer pressure. Yeah. Um, which, you know, we know is extremely effective way to influence behavior. You know, there was a great study in 2008, Rod, 
uh, which you probably were unwillingly and most of us were unwillingly a part of, which was you started going to hotels and seeing cards that said, you know, hang up your towels if you don't want us to wash them and we're going to save this much water and the planet. And, you know, there's a real message there. Well, they did a study. And if they said just the basic message, a certain percentage of people would hang up their towels. If they said people like you in this hotel are hanging up their towels, it was 30% higher. And if they said people like you in this very room have hung up their towels, it was 50% higher. So when you start talking about building a culture of philanthropy, there's a need to build that kind of peer pressure so that everybody is kind of speaking the same language because it really does make an impact in behavior. It really influences behavior. And the fact that we had people outside of the institution parroting back to us what we were saying inside the institution showed me that the word had gotten out and people were talking to their neighbors and their friends and people they went to, to church with or, or synagogue or whatever. And yeah. it, was, it was making a real impact. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So in terms of trusting the process, and you mentioned the number of interviews that we conducted, uh, the, the name came from within the organization. It came from within the university. It was not thrust yeah. upon us. Um, it was organic and was unearthed through the series of interviews from people at all levels, and, was, and from the president to grounds crew. I mean, it was, we talked to everybody. Oh. Now, what, what do you think about the University of South Florida? Well, what, how, how is the University of South Florida tied into your own hopes and dreams? Yeah. Um, and so I, I felt like the, trusting the process and knowing that we could, we would find the name. And I think we probably had 10 or 15 options to choose from, but in the end, they all, they all spoke to the same story. And we chose Unstoppable because as you said earlier, it, it, there was such an, an emotional response to it. So, so much so that um, uh, we had some people kind of stepping back a little bit from it. I, 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 I still laugh about the reaction of athletics. They're like, we don't want our opponents to think that we, you know, we're just going to come in and steamroll them. You remember that reaction? I remember it. It's like, well, this is bigger than athletics. It's bigger than athletics. So it's, uh, it's, it's about the whole institution, right? That's right. That's right. So talk, talk, to our, talk to the folks a little bit about how we saw that impact giving inside the institution, because we are still talking about, you know, creating that culture of philanthropy. Yeah. And, you know, and I, we saw it, Jay, and I've even seen it with subsequent campaigns that I've done, you know, with effective branding and marketing where, you know, it is that pride of the faculty, staff about increased giving, uh, you know, people, you know, you start saying the message and people are believing it's like, oh, I want to make a difference. I want to step up. And we saw that with increased giving uh, at the University of South Florida when we did the Unstoppable campaign. I've saw it. I've seen it here at the uh, Buffalo with our Boldly Buffalo campaign. Just every place that I've been, if you get the right messaging um, and you give people a reason why to believe and why to invest, uh, they really choose to do that. Uh, to the point that it was so successful at South Florida that we actually, it was our campaign brand, mind you, that had to interweave with the university's branding and marketing. But next thing we knew, uh, admissions wanted to adopt it, athletics sometimes wanted to adopt it. Uh, uh, and that uh, I remember student life was wanting to adopt it and some of the stuff they're doing across campus, it's like, okay, we need to make sure we don't lose our identity for the campaign brand, but right. we also understood that it was becoming the very fabric of the university's branding and marketing as well. So it really was a win-win on both sides. It really struck know, you me. to hear about the, it, you know, even because we did a secondary color because the you know, University of South Florida is uh, kind of hunter green and gold. Well, our campaign look was not hunter green. It was more of a seafoam, limey green, if you will. And we saw that color show up later in athletic uniforms and in, in, in uh, marketing, admissions marketing, yeah. brochures and the website and, you know, everywhere. So it really did take hold. And, and I think because we built a graphic identity that was uh, 
so uh, robust, I think that's what got, uh, got everyone's attention in those other departments because they, they saw something that they could hold on to. Well, I would like to think that that color palette was so uh, impressionable that it actually influenced the fashion industry and the home industry because I remember at that time, I also ended up buying a sea foam green um, outdoor uh, uh, patio set and an umbrella. So I had unstoppable green everywhere in my life, including my ties and, and such. So it was a lot of fun. Well, I, you know, and, and when, we, when we talk about the internal communications and going away, just, just to talk about the messaging inside the organization. Uh, I'm working now with a client and they're in the leadership phase of the campaign. And we, we have a pretty good sense of where we're going to go with, with the with the theme of the campaign. Yeah. And it's not fully there yet, but we, we know what the core messaging needs to be. And we're starting the work now of, of creating uh, internal communications avenues to start speaking that message, start talking that talk, so that as, as we build towards the public phase, um, mm -hmm. nothing will be surprising to the internal constituents, to, to the faculty and the staff and to the alumni. They're going to be getting this message. And if you remember at USF, we did a little bit of that as well. We didn't come out and say the name of the, org, uh, the campaign before we went public. That's right. But we did very early on start talking about USF in a new and different way. And that's why I'm, I'm working with clients now that are in the leadership phase. Say so it's never too soon to start talking about your organization, the way you're going to be representing it in the public phase of the campaign. Can't agree more, Jay. And I remember uh, where every campaign that I've been a part of since uh, the USF Unstoppable campaign, Cincinnati, now here at Buffalo, the, the very essence of our campaign branding and messaging has changed the way the university president even speaks and thinks about the university. That's how impactful um, good, strong marketing can be, is to get a university president uh, and multiple university presidents to change their speak and their belief about the institution that then they uh, articulate to others is really powerful. I see we have a... Uh Question, Rod, uh, can you give some examples, data points, photos, anything like that? I'm not sure if he's talking about examples of. Yeah, what I would say in regards to that, I saw that question as well. And the, the next slide that you talk about, and uh, the, it's about the Boldly Buffalo campaign. That's something I can speak about right now because I'm living it. And right. if you want to see examples of typography, look, feel of the branding, the positioning of messaging, you know, you can go to our website and see our campaign website. It's buffalo.edu slash campaign, an easy one to find. And you're going to find examples of all of this there. And you will also see how it uh, is a brand within the brand of the university. And so um, I would encourage you to take a look at that. And uh, I know we have some people behind the scenes that hopefully could post that uh, link uh, to everyone. But once again, it's just buffalo.edu slash campaign. Because the Boldly Buffalo campaign here at the University of Buffalo is doing exactly uh, what everything that we've just talked about with USF Unstoppable. People are repeating it back to me now. Over the past four years that we have been public, uh, I am now getting donors stepping up and say, I'm in. I want part of this direction where the university is going. I believe in it. You make me so proud of my alma mater. Um, I want to do my part to make a difference. And you know, the results are showing in our fundraising success. I mean, during the, the pandemic, uh, we have year over year set records in fundraising for the university. And we're ready to do it again uh, with our fiscal close of June of 22. In just a couple of months, we're going to have another record year. It's, and it's because people really stepping up and wanting to make a difference. And the types of gifts that we're getting We've, we've never seen before. Number of endowed chairs, we typically at, at UB would get one to two a year. Now we're getting anywhere from eight, 10, 12 a year. 
in the latter parts of this campaign because that success is breeding success. We've used the storytelling to inspire others and, and people are just really in developing such deeper pride for the, their alma mater. So you know, just like you had the word unstoppable was a choice. That's right. It was a, it was a definitive choice. We had many to choose from. We chose that word. I think boldly is a choice. It was and, completely and, a choice. And, and I, I worked with you, I think, uh, just before the public launch. And we went, sat down with your communications team and talked about how we were going to kind of construct the messaging around boldly and what that would mean. But, uh, you know, I love, to, I love to hear the fact that people now are coming to you. Yes. And boldly is, res, resonates so much with them and has changed how they see um, – you know, where they live, the, their region of, of the state of New York. Yeah. And, you know, and you think about it is that during the pandemic, um, you know, how, how are we getting our messaging out? How are we being respectful of where the society and the world is at, but also still talking about the uh, um, important aspects of what we're trying to fund at the university to continue to move forward? I mean, we had to take a pause and we had to regroup and rethink in our approach because we didn't want to come across as being insensitive. Uh, we very much had uh, student issues and student emergency funds, but uh, as we have started to uh, uh, get a few more months and years behind us with this pandemic, we've been able to uh, uh, um, relaunch into our efforts to really talk about the impacts uh, that uh, the university and investment in the university could have for the future. Well, I, what, what strikes me, and we, we keep going back to it, Rod, but I think the, 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 the fact that to really change perceptions, you have to strike an emotional chord. You do. And, and we see that uh, and when, we, when we talk about outside perceptions of the institution. We see that with donors and how they perceive themselves as being part of the campaign. We see that in the people that work for your organization, how they perceive the organization, whether it's a university or a, United, or a um, Habitat for Humanity or some other kind of nonprofit. Uh, and now with Buffalo, we're seeing that community-wide. Like it's just, it, it, it's had an impact in how Western New York views itself. And, uh, you know, we know that comprehensive campaign communications can reshape impressions and influence donor decision-making build internal culture, um, but campaigns are changing, Rod, and um, I think communications have to change with the times. I can't agree more, Jay. I mean, I like I said earlier on, this is my eighth campaign uh, that I've been involved with uh, in my career, and um, for the past three that I've been involved with, I think that our campaign communications has just gone up a whole different level. Uh, and I think that has allowed for some great success. But I would say that, you know, now, my, now I'm sitting in the driver's seat as a vice president. I get to decide budgetarily what I spend money on and what I don't. And uh, during the course of this pandemic, you know, I too had to deal with budget cuts and try to figure out where I put my resources and the like. I will tell you, there are certain things I will not cut. And one of those is I will not cut my marketing and communications budget. Right. Um, I, I don't, I think that's the wrong thing to do. And not only did I not cut it, I've increased it. Uh, my staff have shared with me that over the course of the five years that I've been here, the uh, marketing communications budget has gone up 200%. And that is about you know, that effective storytelling and using our communications platform to really create that urgency and why people should be involved and engaged with us either in volunteering or in giving. And uh, there's other things that I won't cut. I won't cut uh, training and conferences for my team because talent management is very important. I want to keep people here. I want them to feel like they're growing and engaged, but I will not cut marketing and communications. It's too important for the work that we do. Well, you know, if we, as we look at the future of campaigns, and I, let me just say as a professional communicator, I greatly appreciate the fact that you will not 
got communications and marketing because often <laughs> oh, I'm telling you that now, you know, come on. <laughs> often, oftentimes it's the first thing on the chopping block. And I, I agree with you. Right. I think it be the absolute last thing you do. Um, sort of the, the port of last resort. But right. uh, if you really want to have some fun, uh, after you go to the Boldly Buffalo website, go to Google and type in the future of fundraising and see the thousands of entries you're going to find that are all in disagreement with each other. Um, at BWF, we're starting a deep dive now into this subject. What, what, what's the future of campaigns? What does it look like? And you know, we, there's all number of options, you know, continuing comprehensive campaigns, small project focused campaigns, some hybrid of the two, you know, fundraising goals that maybe uh, ebb, and, uh, ebb and flow depending upon, you know, where you are as an institution. Uh, but we're asking questions like what happens now that the old 80-20 rule is more like a 92 to 8 rule. Um, but at the same time, over the last 42 years, there's only three years where giving in real dollars has gone down. And as I pointed out to you earlier this week, two of those years were the first two years you and I worked together. So <laughs> 2008, 2009. Um, and large campaigns now last an average of seven and a half years and the public phase of those is three and a half years. And all of this happens in a, in a setting where it's really hard to get people's attention. It's really hard to, to your point about not cutting communications and marketing. Right. I mean, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data produced every day. Um, you know, if you want to have some fun, type, type in 18 zeros into the chat and see how long that goes. It, it's an enormous amount of data every day, every minute, the number of YouTube users, email sent, tweets sent, gigabytes of internet data being used. I mean, these numbers are staggering and they're real. You know, 121 emails a day. 121. And I thought, well, that's crazy. And then I started thinking about it. I was like, it's not crazy. It yeah. might be underselling it for some of us. I think so. I walk away from my email for a day and it, uh, it's more than that, but... <laughs> <laughs> Six, six, everyone has six to seven, uh, I think the actual number is 6.7 social media apps on their phone. They spend over two hours a day on social media. So this is the environment that as communicators and campaign communicators we're trying to break into, even as campaigns themselves are changing. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's what is both exciting and, and perhaps a little daunting in the industry now is, is getting through to all, to everyone, when there's so much out there that's competing for our attention. But I think, and I, and I think even with an incredibly crowded communications ecosystem, I, I think some of these tried and true still hold sway. I, I still think you have to develop and tell stories that focus on impact because impact is about emotion and emotion is what drives giving and investment and involvement and volunteering and all those things. The parts of the brain that light up when we want them to light up, all of that is based on stories of impact and emotion. I think where we have to take the environment into account is in the flexibility we have in telling these stories, how we're telling them, being very focused as we talked about in the question earlier, being very focused on target audiences, maybe having different messages for different audiences, certainly having different methods, different platforms for different audiences. Um, you might want to use TikTok. You might want to use email. You might want to use, uh, you know, a telephone or video or, you know, there's, but every audience has a best way to be reached. And our role as communicators and, and my role is communications consultant is to help people find those best ways and get the bright messages to the right people at the right time but in the right way. And then, boy, we talked about this with Boldly Buffalo, but every campaign I've been involved in, and there's been a lot of them now, you said you've been involved in eight. I've probably been involved in one way or the other and at least that many. Uh, the power of the campaign messages lies in the heart of the institution. 
in taking the time to understand who you are and what you're about is just critical to telling stories with authenticity. That's really it, Jay. You know, and I, uh, I have uh, a great uh, co um, consulting firm that I work with that specializes in training gift officers on how to approach this work. And, uh, you know, there's, there's those things as loyalty gifts that are pretty much the small gifts, but our jobs are really to not only uh, we appreciate the loyalty gifts and uh, focus on them, but we also want to inspire those passion gifts. And that really is knowing yourself, knowing where you're going, knowing who your uh, constituents are and what's important to them and trying to connect. And uh, I think it's the power of communication, storytelling and, uh, and, this, and, and the like that really allows us to make those connections. And, and making connections, and we, we do have a question here. Uh, great data here. Can you provide the source for us a reference to our teams? And, and the answer is a lot of that comes from the Edelman Trust Barometer. So uh, you can you can check that out online. But there's a, there's a number of places that uh, provide that kind of information. But uh, a good bit of it is now coming from Edelman. They're doing an annual study on the state of communications and all the different messages and, and just the feeling of if you feel like you're being bombarded by with information it's because you are yeah and, and heather i see you asked the question is the 92 april really sustainable for the future of uh, fundraising and what i would probably say to that is that um you know, it's a much more complex question to answer because uh, donor counts are going down and people are giving in different ways and to different types of organizations and why. And I think that in many ways is generational. Uh, Jay and I have talked about this. He can talk and, and consult with you even on that even more. Um, I think that at the same time, you ask the question, is, is it sustainable? Well, the, the other issue that we have is that the wealth generation in America is still going way up. And then we have people uh, with making larger and larger gifts that makes that number probably sustainable. I think that it does. It's just connecting your mission with uh, uh, the right storytelling with the right types of donors to get the people to invest. And uh, not everyone's going to get a gift from Mackenzie Scott that's going to transform their organization, but there's a lot of other people out there that are, are finding ways to give and, and are realizing the importance of giving back. So, um, you know, it's hard to plan for those huge gifts sometimes, but I do believe that uh, I don't see it going away. And I, I agree with that, Rod. And I, and I think if anything, the fact that it's now 92 to eight makes it that much more important that you personalize the storytelling function within a campaign. Because yeah. you really are gonna be targeting very specific people or maybe foundations or maybe uh, you know, funds that are run by people. And you have, to, um, you have to make sure that the stories you tell uh, are not so generic as to not be impactful to the to those, that small number. Okay, I, and that's, that is our uh, lunch hour or brunch hour, depending upon where you are in the country. Uh, and we're happy to have any final questions. And uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me, uh, my name, Rod Grabowski, uh, you can, uh, 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 find me on LinkedIn, connect on LinkedIn, and I'm happy to uh, uh, connect with you and uh, share more insights uh, if you have specific questions from a higher ed standpoint. And you can see my uh, BWF email there and uh, direct phone number, and I'm on LinkedIn also, Jay Wilson, APR, CPRC. So thank you everyone for joining us. We've uh, we really had a good time uh, continuing our conversation, and here's to another here's to another 14 years at least. Absolutely. Thank you, Jay. This has been great fun. Thank you. Bye-bye.